welcome. Good morning, Professor. Good morning to morning. you, everybody. Good morning to everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. My, my name is Lisang Nyati. Uh, here I have Udav and Federica, uh, my, my classmates. We are together attending a course on academic freedom. And we are really honored to be interviewing you today on academic freedom. Uh, so thank you so much for your, your time and to be here with us so that we can discuss some of the areas that we think are more interesting to explore with regards to academic freedom. Uh, so each of us has a question for you. Uh, so I'm going to start with my question. So we know that academic freedom is a concept that has become really relevant, especially in the contemporary society. And I am more interested in knowing the meaning of academic freedom. And in that regard, my question becomes, what kind of freedom exactly is academic freedom? In the sense that, is it really a right or when we speak of academic freedom, we are speaking of a principle. Okay, well, first of all, let me thank you for this invitation. I'm very proud to be here and to be to have this opportunity to have this global discussion about the about a universal right. So let me <laughs> let me answer first from uh, of, of your of your question. Uh, it's a fundamental, at, at the same time, an universal right. Because as you know, uh, without academic freedom, it's really, uh, I would say, impossible to have democracy mm -hmm. in, every, in every area. Uh, if, you, if you remember uh, you know, if you re the history of uh, uh, Galileo Galilei, you know, the, 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 famous, uh, the, the famous scientist, the Italian scientist, that at the end of a, an horrible uh, um, process against the, the Inquisition has to to say that the uh, the theory the, the theory uh, of Galileo Galilei weren't exact because they they will still exact the only theory that uh, the, the you know the earth is flat and so and there it is not uh, related to the idea that uh, the, 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 the earth will not move. And so the heliocentric idea, it's, it's still uh, coming back from the century to the Galileo Galilei method, is the idea that, that without a uh, scientific method, you will not have an academic freedom. So academic freedom is certainly a right, but it's also a principle. What that means, uh, it, it could be, uh, it could be strange, you know, this answer. But it's a principle because it's it's part of a world uh, principle, wider principle. Sorry, uh, that is related to the freedom of expression. So the academic right is related to the freedom of expression, but also is related to the idea that uh, you have the right to education. So. It's something between the freedom of, of expression and the right to education. So all these rights are at the same time a principle. Uh, if your question is, uh, if you have a right, you can use this right to go to stand in front of the court and ask to the court that uh, this, the fulfillment of this right. This is true, but it's also true in the from the constitutional point of view, that every right is a principle. Just to make an example, uh, you have the right to be equal, you know, in in every relation. But also the principle of equality, it's it's the same principle. So uh, principle and rights. I'm talking from a European point of view. Maybe there are differences in, in other in other uh, ju uh, jurisdictional culture, but. From the European from the European countries, the idea, a principle and right are the same significance because principle can be um, can be um, uh, can be used by the legislator or the judge just to say 
that you have a right in, in, in some area. So at the end, your, your, your question is right or principle are both at the same time. Okay, um, thank you. Yes, because I, I, I mean, I was making this distinction because when you are, for example, if you take a look at some constitutions in different countries, but not only limited to European context, you realize that the way academic freedom is formulated, it's not exactly explicitly formulated to say the right to academic freedom. It's either it is presented in the form of uh, a, a, a principle that comes to complement, for example, as you have said, uh, the right to education, or freedom of scientific research. So it makes sense, uh, the explanation that you've given and thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Professor Demuro. Uh, I am Uddhav Gautam, and I would like to draw your focus more importantly towards academic freedom in context of EU law. Uh, I would like to ask you, since EU acts according to the principle of conferral of the member states, on what grounds actually is the EU competent to act on academic freedom? Like to what extent or effect on this day how has the EU actually contributed to the international or global protection of the concept of academic freedom? Thank you. Okay. Um, to answer the, to this question, you have to have, have very clear how it works, uh, relationship between member states and EU level. So uh, obviously talking from the a constitutional right that I said is a, a also a universal right. I mean, it's not only European. It, it's a it's a right for everybody all around the world, because everybody needs to have a, an academic freedom. But talking from the European point of view, uh, you know that Europe, uh, the European um, Union, is a sort of a I use the the word that the federal. Uh, constitutional court in Germany used, that the European Union is an association of states. And, and I will add that it's an association of states that has a very, very, very long tradition. So they have academic rights inside the constitution, some explicit, some implicit. This doesn't matter, but I mean, it's important that they have. So they have constitution, that said that, the, that there is this academic right, okay? Uh, the EU Charter of Human Rights, it's a new acquisition of the European Union. Uh, that doesn't mean that wasn't inside before, but it's what is new, it's that it's written only a couple of 20, last 20 years. And it's only more than 10 years that the Charter of Human Rights, it's part of the EU system, EU legal system. That means from, the, from a, a jurist point of view that uh, not only free movement of person, not only free uh, um, uh, you know, uh, free economy inside Europe and all the other pillars of the of, of economic relationship in Europe is important. It's also important that EU has, I would say the word in a, in a coma, uh, that EU has a sort of a EU constitution for rights. That doesn't mean that you have a level, that you have a national level where you have this right, and you also have another European level that, that you have this right. So what can happen? And actually happen, we, we discussed this, and you remember in September, uh, that one of the member states can pass a law that maybe is not against the, the, the state constitution, but now is against the EU level of a protection of human rights. So that's that's the Hungary case and also the, the, the Poland case. Uh, 
in this significance uh, means that when you uh, want to uh, respect academic right, you have to respect this academic right at the EU level, but also at the state level. If it doesn't respect at the state level and you infringe the EU level, you're doing something which is against the EU relationship. So uh, the EU is competent, but it's competent in every part where EU is competent. I, I'm sorry, this it seems like a joke, but it's uh, but it's it's how it works. Uh, I would say the word confederation of states because the EU is not a federation of states, not like Canada or United States or, or Mexico or other states. It's uh, every single state has its own very strong tradition, but at the EU level, this right has to be respected. Uh, I'm not, I don't know if you, if you all are familiar with the theory of the core of every single, of the theory of the core of every single uh, fundamental right. So every single fundamental right has a core, has a core business that has to be respected. So you, I would say the state can do better than the EU level, but they cannot get against this core. And the core is scientific method. And the core is uh, freedom of expression of professors, freedom of expression of students, and uh, uh, the right to say something against the power. So every single uh, possibility to say that from an academic point of view, I have my freedom is without limits. I, I, will say, I would say this in a very strong way and say, if you look at the article of the European Charter, you will see uh, the word uh, that academic freedom, freedom of science, is related to the freedom of arts. Arts and science has no limits. I know it's difficult, but this is a, this is a, the the real idea that if you if you are free, uh, you are free to even to say that uh, the earth moves around the uh, the sun you know like galileo galilei but at the, at the end of the process has, he, he has to to the say to the catholic church that it, this is not true but it, it was true of course thank you professor you're welcome thank you for, um, good morning professor i'm federica and uh, the the other question is more concentrated, it's more focused on uh, the situation of Italy. Italy. Thinking about the situation of Italy, what are, in your opinion, the, the strength, the strength, especially on a legal, on a legal point of view, on the protection of academic freedom? And yet, what could be possible the main challenges the, Ita the Italy have to face? Your regard of academic freedom. Um, I, let me first say that Italy has a very good situation for respect for academic freedom. Um, the only concern is a concern related to the idea that uh, there are some methods uh, that the scientists use that are um, a little bit in contradiction with the idea that some of the population has uh, what the scientist has to do. So just to explain what I would like to say, uh, we don't have a, a real problem for academic freedom in Italy. We have a, a problem of a scientist culture in Italy. I would say science culture in Italy. Uh, just to make an example, uh, 
there is a law which is a, uh, a very disputed law about how to use experiment for uh, drugs. I'm talking about pharmaceutical drugs, of, of course, and uh, uh, how to use uh, the caveat. I don't know how to, how to say it in English caveat, but maybe you want to use a, a small rabbit okay. or, uh, or, or a monkey or uh, animals. Uh, when you want to make your experiment, uh, there are some experiments that are very cruel. It's true. There are experiments that are cruel. Because, for example, there is a famous case called uh, Lucentis case. Lucentis, it's a, it's a drug that helps the people who has a very, very bad ill uh, for that, you know, for the eyes that brings you to blindness. And there is a drug that can help you to uh, slow down this process, okay? Uh, the scientists, if they, if they, they need to make Proof. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, um, with how every single step of, uh, of a drug before is, uh, uh, is it, it can be used by the population. There are four phases, and every single phase has a method. And so the problem is how. Coming back to the first question, I have the right to academic. But how can we uh, make uh, a balance between the right of academic freedom, so the men and the women use animals to make uh, experiment, because animals, and especially monkeys, are the closest um, reaction uh, for the drugs that can be used before uh, giving this drug to the population. So the question it, 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 I'm saying, I'm, uh, I'm asking you a, a question now. Uh, what do you think there is a limit when the legislator has to put a limit? And this is not easy to say, uh, because in my opinion, and that's my opinion, uh, I would say the limit is the scientific method. So every scientific experiment that is important, that is significant, that is uh, useful to help uh, to have a more and more uh, clear science for the future has to be done. But in Italy, we have a law that maybe could be have some problem around Europe that is very, very, very narrow. I, it's not important, I, you, you can look at the law directly, but uh, that calls to the academic scientists a sort of a single problem to, uh, to arrive uh, and to use this. They can use the, the animals, but they use the animals in a very, very difficult situation. This is against academic freedom. Uh, could be because if I don't, uh, if I don't have enough uh, possibility to make an experiment, could be something against academic freedom. So sometimes, if you look at the law, animals. Uh, I, I, excuse me for my very clear uh, I cut like a knife, but animals are more important. And then wellness of, of animals are more important than the humans. And this could be a problem. I mean, there is also an, a new uh, law in the constitution at Article 9 
where the rights of animals are inside the constitution. And so we will see what the, the new law, there is none. It, it's a very new uh, uh, law in the constitution. So we don't have a new, we don't have a new law that implement this, the right of animals. So where is the balance between the right of animals and the right of the humans? Uh, another question in Italy could be, because you were, we are a welfare state. And uh, so most of the research is funded by the public power. And this is more related to the idea that everybody has to uh, talk from the equal, equal uh, principle Every, every scientist has the same right, or every single scientist to have the same grant to arrive to, to, to study some questions. But the money is not infinite. So what can be the uh, rule that can be used to say that one scientist has to be to have more money to make his research. So the problem is how we can evaluate the research. Uh, but these are, I would say, these are questions related to a wealthy system for academic freedom. I mean, I'm talking just about the details, uh, you know? And so uh, my answer to your question is more that in Italy we need more and more a culture for, for science. We are, uh, you know, the problem, we're starting again to discuss if uh, 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 anti-COVID vax should be done or not. Scientists said, that has to be done. And uh, so can a law said that has not to be done? Uh, these are open question. I mean, an open question now in, in the discussion in Italy. So more science education, but the academic freedom is, is respected in Italy. OK, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Professor. Um, the last question would be, what, given what you've said, I, I think that Italy offers uh, a hope for, for the future. But on a global level, what would you say is the future of academic freedom? And this is my last question, thank you. So your last question is related to the global uh, idea of academic freedom. Is this your question? Robert? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Ah, that's, that, that's a very complicated question. <laughs> uh, because uh, as I said in the, at the beginning that a right is a universal right. But the problem is how can we help to make it global? And uh, for example, just to make an example from the pandemic, what we have learned from the pandemic, that uh, we can certainly learn that uh, the right to have a healthy life, it's a global, it's a global right. And uh, it's a global right because uh, I would say nobody can saved by himself. So it's clear, talking about the relationship between the, the right to have a healthy life, uh, the academic freedom was absolutely very uh, important and clear to produce a uh, vax, just to make an example, that are useful for the population. I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor, but I can say that where academic right is, where academic freedom is respected, 
in democracies, uh, we can say that, you know, vaccines are more efficient than other uh, vaccines uh, uh, related to other countries that they didn't have, uh, you know, this, this possibility. So when you always have academic freedom, you will have better rights in all the other possibilities. Uh, so I would say it has to be global, like vaccine, vaccination has to be global, like uh, freedom of movement, like uh, freedom of education, like uh, freedom of, uh, what we are doing now, I mean, freedom of discussing a problem from different point of view. It's a real global uh, question. But if you ask me if there is a, an authority that can put compulsory this right, yes, there is one. It's the international contest, but it, it's the international treaty. It's the Native, uh, United Nations, is UNESCO, is all the, but it's, it's a difficult situation now for universal rights. In a situation of uh, war, like we are now, uh, one of the things that we have to, to do is that we have a more and more, uh, I would say, a more and more important duty hmm? that, that has to be done that if you want a universal right, you have to respect international law. Uh, it's the only concern about this possibility. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. And once again, thank you for your time and for uh, answering to our questions. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And uh, buona fortuna. Good luck. <laughs>